Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Deep within the eerie swamps of Florida lies a legend that has haunted locals for centuries the Moss Man. Towering at seven feet tall and covered in a tangled mess of foliage and moss, this creature blends seamlessly into its surroundings, making it nearly invisible to the unsuspecting. Its glowing, amber eyes pierce through the darkness, creating an aura of terror for anyone who dares to wander into its domain. Reports of the Moss Man date back to the 1800s, with tales of frightening encounters woven into the fabric of local folklore. One chilling encounter in 1978 brought the Moss Man into the public eye when a couple strolling along a beach near Boca Raton stumbled upon what they first thought was a man in a raincoat. As they drew closer, the figure rose, revealing its true nature and sending the couple fleeing in terror. Since then, numerous sightings have emerged each adding to the mystique and fear surrounding this enigmatic beast. Is the Moss Man a guardian spirit of the swamp, a Bigfoot-like creature covered in vegetation, or something even more otherworldly? The legend continues to grow, inviting brave souls to uncover the truth in the murky depths of Florida's swamplands. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… From reports of undead creatures terrorizing Eastern Europe in the 1700s, to scientific explanations behind the myths, we'll take a brief look at vampires and how they straddle the boundary between fiction and fact. Parking tickets, floppy disks, and escaped victims helped catch a few of the most infamous serial killers of all time. Can a hair salon be haunted? You might want to check before your next appointment, assuming you don't want a hair-raising experience. In 1849 Cincinnati, a gruesome murder in a boarding house shocked the community, revealing a tragic tale of love, abuse, and desperation, eventually exposing a case of domestic abuse that left the courtroom and the city forever changed. A 911 caller frantically said, I swear to God this is not a joke, describing towering, alien-like figures with big eyes that had invaded their backyard. But first, the eerie swamps of Florida hide many secrets, but none as chilling as the legend of the Moss Man. We begin with that story. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. The thick swamps of Florida can be a spooky place to say the least. The tangles of cypress trees, vines, and brush are clouded with mosquitoes and infested with all manner of insects and snakes. The murky, muddy waters are prowled by alligators lying in wait for the unwary. When the sun goes down, the swamp comes alive with sounds not always immediately identifiable, punctuated with shrieks and squawks from unknown sources. This symphony of the night casts the swamp into an eerie ambiance that invites tales of strange monsters prowling its darkest recesses. One of these is a hulking creature that wades through the waters and crashes through all in its path, a glowing-eyed beast known only as the Moss Man. The creature gets its strange name from its unique appearance. Humanoid, 
bipedal, and somewhat ape-like, standing around seven feet tall. It might sound like Bigfoot at first. However, the odd details make it even stranger. The Mossman earns its name from the copious foliage and grass that seems to either grow upon it or be intertwined and entangled with its hair, giving it a green cast and helping it camouflage nearly perfectly. Some sightings describe it being mistaken for an overgrown tree or log before it suddenly stands up to walk off through the swamp. Its eyes are also said to glow an amber or reddish hue, with some reports claiming they have an almost hypnotic quality. According to local lore, the Mossman has allegedly been encountered in these wetland wildernesses since at least the 1800s. One such report from this era describes a large, man-like beast with a rank odor and covered with swamp grass, terrorizing the swamps in Clay County and raiding rabbit pens and livestock. This prompted a local sheriff named Sheriff Peeler to organize an armed posse of men to hunt it down. They spent several weeks slogging through the muck, dodging alligators and venomous snakes, but without success. Other strange reports from the time describe fishermen being menaced or even attacked by an ape-like brute covered with leaves and branches. An even earlier legend might have sprung from the presence of the creature. According to this tale, in the 1500s, Spanish conquistadors raped, killed, and beheaded a local native girl, tying her disembodied head to a tree and greatly angering the tribe. Their most powerful medicine man then used his magic to call upon the spirits of the swamp to seek vengeance. The girl's head grew to become part of the wilderness, taking on a human form made of weeds, branches, and other vegetation. She went on to hunt down any Spaniards she could find. In some versions of the story, a witch doctor later created his own golem of foliage to keep the Spanish away, and when this threat was gone, it continued to prowl the swamps to this day. While these reports and legends are interesting, the Moss Man truly made its debut in the public consciousness in 1978. A couple claimed that they had been taking a leisurely stroll along a beach in Boca Raton, right up along the Everglades swampland, when they spotted something odd lying on the sand by a rocky outcropping. As they drew nearer, they saw that it appeared to be a person in a raincoat sprawled out face down. However, as they passed it, what they had taken at first to be a man stood up to stare at them with baleful, glowing red eyes, and they could see that this was no human being. The raincoat was actually a twisted mat of thick moss, grass, and leafy foliage. The couple fled for their lives, and when they returned later, there was some Spanish moss strewn about, but no sign of the beast itself. When this report hit the news, others began to come forward with their own stories of spotting a similar massive bipedal creature with a moss and leaf-encrusted body. Sometimes it was seen in the swamp, other times on the beach, or even cavorting about within the waves, especially near Red Reef Park, West Palm Beach, and Hillsborough Beach. The most famous report came in 1980, when an elderly couple was visiting Red Reef Park, a 67-acre coastal nature preserve. They were hiking through the scenic area when they sighted a green object on a branch. The woman approached, thinking it was a swamp bird perched on a mossy tree, but this bird turned around, revealing the fierce-looking face of the Moss Man. The terrified woman feared for her life, but the brutish creature turned back around and loped off into the wilderness. There have been sporadic sightings of the Moss Man ever since, with accounts describing it as a flesh-and-blood animal or, in other cases, as more ghostly or demonic in nature, able to appear or disappear at will or even shroud itself in a cloud of mist. Considering the details of the reports, theories abound on what the creature could be. Some suggest it is a Bigfoot-like creature, either covered with vegetation that has grown upon it or intentionally covering itself with foliage as camouflage. Others propose far-out ideas that it might be a humanoid plant, a forest spirit, an interdimensional entity, a demon, an alien, or an avatar of the swamp itself taking humanoid form. 
More rational explanations included being a trick of light on the trees, a hunter in a camouflaged outfit called a ghillie suit, or that it is all pure myth and urban legend. What is the Mossman? Whatever it may be, the legend of the mysterious Mossman lives on. With its strange appearance and the eerie ambiance of the Florida swamps, it's no wonder this tale continues to capture the imagination. Whether it's a real creature lurking in the swamps or just a figment of our collective fears, the story of the Mossman is a fascinating piece of local folklore that adds to the rich tapestry of cryptid legends in America and the weirdness of Florida. When Weird Darkness returns, parking tickets, floppy disks, and escaped victims helped catch a few of the most infamous serial killers of all time. But first, a 911 caller frantically said, I swear to God, this is not a joke, describing towering, alien-like figures with big eyes that had invaded their backyard. That story is up next. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. On May 1, 2023, at approximately 12.29 a.m., LVMPD dispatch received a call about a suspicious situation. That's how the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department described the events of an early morning 911 call in an email statement sent to news outlets. For the people directly involved in the incident, however, things were not so nonchalant. I swear to God this is not a joke the caller told the operator a little before officers arrived on the scene. This is actually… we're terrified. As the caller would later tell responding officers, he and his family saw a big something with light fall out of the sky and into their backyard. He was followed almost immediately by something even more. They're like 8 foot, 9 foot, 10 foot, they look like aliens to us. Big eyes, they have big eyes, like I can't explain it, and a big mouth the caller told the 911 dispatcher, not human, they're 100 percent not human. According to later reports, the creatures continued to observe the caller and his family, even after they went into the house. There's like an eight-foot person beside it, and another's inside, and it has big eyes, and it's looking at us, and it's still there. It was like a big creature, one witness told the responding officers. Even the police found themselves shaken up by the unexpected call. This was partly because earlier in the night, officers themselves had spotted a glowing object seemingly falling from the sky, an incident that was captured on body cam footage. Everybody saw a shooting star, now these people say there's aliens in their backyard, one of the officers was recorded saying on the way to the call, I'm so nervous right now, I have butterflies, bro. By the time officers arrived on the scene, however, any evidence that might have been there was already long gone, according to authorities, who closed the event as unfounded. However, in the body cam footage obtained from the officer who conducted the initial investigation, it's clear that the event is being taken seriously as he interviews passing motorists to see if they spotted anything in the sky. If those nine-foot beings come back, don't call us, all right? the officer says to the caller near the end of the investigation, his voice indicating that he is joking but also maybe not. I ain't dealing with that. That might have been the end of it. But we live in an internet age, and anything as evocative as the 911 call and body cam footage that came out of that Las Vegas sighting is bound to have a lifespan online. In this case, footage began to leak onto the internet that purported to show the creatures themselves. One tweet from the Twitter account CBK News 121 
shows what looks to be night vision footage of a hunched, humanoid creature with long fingers and a nearly featureless face. Watch, exhorts the tweet, which got more than 10,000 likes. Actual alien footage from the Las Vegas UFO landing, it said. Sadly, this account has since been suspended. Possibly for good reason. According to Reuters, the video was one of several circulating that combines audio from the 911 call and news reports about the incident with CGI-created imagery to produce fake footage that supposedly shows the aliens that the callers claim to have seen. Reporting from Reuters linked to the initial video of the creature, sans the 911 call audio, with a visual effects TikToker called Owl Tree Stump, who shared the video on June 9, 2023, with the caption, Shake my head, knew I shouldn't investigate noises outside, along with a string of hashtags including cryptid, creepy, and blendered, a software program used in 3D animation. While UFO sightings have been a major part of American popular culture since World War II, the report from Las Vegas comes amid a recent uptick in interest in unidentified aerial phenomena, UAPs, the official term for what most people still call UFOs. This interest can be traced to a number of declassified documents and videos released by the Pentagon in 2023, as well as four unidentified craft shot down by Air Force planes in February of 2023. However, perhaps nothing has so reignited our mania for all things extraterrestrial than the stories of David Grush, a former intelligence officer for the United States Air Force turned whistleblower who asserts that the United States government has maintained a secret program for decades recovering intact and partially intact non-human aircraft, not to mention dead pilots. He also claimed that this information was being withheld from Congress. Following a 2022 whistleblower complaint filed with the U.S. Office of the Intelligence Community Inspector General, Grush went public with his claims in June of 2023. Among the postulations laid out in his statements is the claim that Mussolini's fascist Italian government recovered a non-human spacecraft during World War II, and that the Vatican later helped the United States government to acquire said craft. Grush also asserts that he has spoken with intelligence officials who have been briefed on football field-sized spacecraft, as well as malevolent activity by extraterrestrials, to name just a few of Grush's outlandish statements. Though Grush's assertions seem downright fanciful, echoing the sort of bombastic claims made by a crackpot conspiracy theorist for decades, his position as a former intelligence official lends him an air of credibility that he might otherwise lack, and he apparently has the attention of at least a few members of Congress. What does all this mean for the family that claims to have seen inhuman creatures some eight or ten feet tall in their backyard in Las Vegas? Perhaps nothing except to say that they are far from alone in reporting strange sights in the sky and odd intruders into their lives. For now, if the creatures they saw were real, they appear to have vanished. But if Grush is telling even a fraction of the truth, they'll probably be back. serial killers often pride themselves on being untouchable. That confidence can sometimes help them charm their way into their victims' lives or allow them to lead double lives, tricking their families into believing they are someone else. But it also leads to their downfall. Here are five stories of serial killers who, along with a little luck, were the cause of their capture. Jeffrey Dahmer, known as the Milwaukee Cannibal, got away with molesting, murdering, dismembering, and eating 17 victims between 1978 and 1991. By 1988, he'd already spent 10 months in jail for fondling a 13-year-old boy and then offering him $50 to pose for pictures in the nude. He was let out early and put on probation, but his caseworker never made the required stops by his apartment. At one point during his 13-year murder spree, Dahmer was also approached by police over a young Asian teen who was found on a curb, naked and bloody. Dahmer told the police that the boy was his partner, and so three officers who were eventually investigated turned their heads and declined to investigate further, leading to the young boy's death. All of that makes how Dahmer got caught so darkly ironic. 
When Dahmer was arrested, it was thanks to someone he had caught. Dahmer drugged and attempted to murder 32-year-old Tracy Edwards in July of 1991. Edwards got out and, after running away, was found by two officers in Dahmer's neighborhood, almost completely naked with a pair of handcuffs dangling from one of his wrists. When officers questioned him, Edwards told them that a freak had drugged and handcuffed him. The police brought Edwards back to Dahmer's apartment to investigate. Upon their arrival, Dahmer offered police the keys to the handcuffs. When Edwards told them that Dahmer attempted to use a knife on him in his bedroom, an officer entered the room to corroborate his account. There, he found photographs of the bodies Dahmer had dismembered. Dahmer was arrested by the police, and further searching of his apartment revealed body parts, skulls, and jars of disembodied genitalia stored in the fridge, freezer, and filing cabinet, and a kettle. The infamous killer Son of Sam was arrested in Manhattan right before he planned to go down in a blaze of glory. Known for shooting 14 people, six of whom were killed in New York City between 1976 and 1977, David Berkowitz was a member of the U.S. Army who served in South Korea as an excellent marksman. After returning to his hometown in 1974, following his service term, he took a position as a U.S. postal worker before turning his combat skills into a method of terror. After attacking and murdering his victims, he would leave a note near the crime scene taunting authorities. Ironically, it would be a different kind of crime scene note that took down the man who called himself the Son of Sam. The first step towards arresting Berkowitz was a result of him regularly harassing his neighbors. Several of the other residents in his Yonkers apartment building claimed that they were left anonymous, sometimes antagonistic notes. One reported that their dog had been shot with the same gun used by the Son of Sam, while another alleged a fire was started near his apartment. This put the police onto Berkowitz's behavior and kept him under their watchful eye. What ultimately nailed the son of Sam, though, was a tip from a 49-year-old woman who had a brief but unnerving encounter with Berkowitz right before he murdered two people. While walking her dog at 2.30 a.m., Cecilia Davis passed a man who looked her right in the face but held his right arm down stiffly. Minutes later, she heard shots and a car horn. She also happened to see an officer ticketing a cream-colored van a block from the site of Berkowitz's latest and final murder. After Davis came forward with her details, police checked their tickets for that night and were able to find a citation for Berkowitz's car, which he used for getaways from each murder but didn't bother to change his plates for. The authorities caught Berkowitz leaving his apartment. As they caught up to him, Berkowitz turned to an inspector and said, I guess this is the end of the trail. Ted Bundy, known for raping and murdering 36 women in three states, was captured twice while driving. The first instance was for a traffic violation in which he took a Utah Highway Patrol officer on a chase after he was caught driving his Volkswagen in a West Valley neighborhood without his headlights on. As Officer Bob Hayward questioned Bundy, he noticed weird things. The man was wearing all black, a collection of gas receipts, a missing passenger seat, and a pair of shiny shoes that escaped kidnapping victim Carol DeRanche had reported were worn by her captor. When the officer asked Bundy where he had been, the killer told him at a local drive-in, watching Towering Inferno. Unfortunately for Bundy, Hayward knew this was a lie. He had been at the drive-in all night. Hayward called for backup, and he and two other officers searched the car, uncovering a collection of obscure items like rope, handcuffs, pantyhose and a crowbar before bringing him in. Booked for avoiding arrest, Bundy was identified in a lineup by Deranche, arrested for her kidnapping, and sentenced to 15 years of jail time. Hayward had also reached out to out-of-state police departments, aware of their own missing teen cases. Two years into his sentence, Bundy was linked to the murder of a Colorado woman. After requesting to act as his own representation, he escaped from a prison's library window while preparing for his case. He was captured eight days later but would escape again through a hole he dug in the ceiling of a cell. Due to the reduced staff during holiday time, correctional officers didn't notice he was gone for well over 12 hours, letting him get a significant lead. With the help of his eventual wife, Carol Ann Boone, Bundy was able to travel to Florida where he attacked the Chi Omega sorority house at Florida State University 
killing two college women and beating two others. Days later, he would kidnap and murder a 12-year-old Florida girl in a stolen FSU van and only four days later after that stole a VW Bug. Fearing that authorities were closing in, Bundy traveled all the way to Alabama state line before getting pulled over for driving a stolen vehicle. That would be the end of Bundy's run. He was arrested, charged, and sentenced to death for the murders of the FSU students. After years of going uncaught following the murder of ten Kansas locals, including four out of five members of the Otero family, the Kansas serial killer whose modus operandi was bind, strangle, kill entered into a game of cat and mouse with authorities. After seemingly killing his last victim in 1991, the murderer fell off the radar until 2004 when an article in the Wichita Eagle suggested that the infamous killer might either be dead or in prison. That spurred Dennis Rader, the BTK killer, to send a letter to the newspaper claiming he was responsible for a 1986 unsolved murder. Over the next 12 months, he would send more letters and puzzles to local media outlets. In 2005, Rader took the first step to sealing his demise. As he had for the past year, Rader sent a local Wichita TV station a message in the form of a package placed in the back of a truck. An employee found it and ended up tossing it, but after no response, Rader reached out to the station to see if they had gotten it. The station notified the police, who searched the area and found the cereal box Rader left filled with documents many of which revealed planned murders. There was also a piece of paper addressed directly to authorities saying, "'Can I communicate with Floppy and not be traced to a computer?' Rader asked. If the police were honest, they should tell him through a classified ad in the paper. So that's exactly what authorities, less than honestly, did. Two weeks later, a local Kansas broadcast station was sent a package containing a floppy disk. When they opened it, it merely included the message, this is a test. After checking the properties section of the file, authorities discovered that the last person to save the file was a man named Dennis. They also uncovered that it had been used at the Christ Lutheran Church and the Park City Library. Despite the effort Dennis Rader took to delete identifying information from the disk, his choice to use a library printer – his own was broken – did him in. The police googled the name and locations attached to the file, used DNA evidence from the Otero crime scene and one of Raider's relatives, and finally pinned Raider for some of the most infamous murders in America. Like the son of Sam, Israel Keyes was a former soldier raised in a Mormon family who reveled in his fascination and obsession with serial murder. With an extensive knowledge of his predecessors, Keyes aimed to be unique and uncatchable but eventually fell victim to what he thought separated him from the rest – a lack of control. Identified as a serial killer, rapist, arsonist, burglar, and bank robber, Keyes had a girlfriend and daughter. Despite having spent more than a decade raping, robbing, and killing victims around the country, three deaths were tied directly to him, but anywhere between eight and twelve are alleged. Key success was due in part to his extensive planning, which included burying murder kits – that's weapons, cash, and tools to clean up crime scenes – and an unwritten rule based on his research and knowledge of other captured serial killers. He would travel outside and go to great lengths to distance himself from any of his crimes, Anchorage homicide detective Monique Dahl told ABC News. That was primarily derived from his obsession with not being like the other serial killers. He had researched and read other serial killers, Dole told ABC. He knew a lot about Ted Bundy. He was very careful to say that he had not patterned himself after any other serial killers, that his ideas were his own. That necessity for distinction and control, all signatures of serial killers, got the best of him during his last murder, which was only supposed to be a robbery. With plans to take the register at the coffee shop, Keyes confessed that he thought about not killing his victim, a young female employee working alone, if she didn't have a car. But upon seeing his victim, he was overcome, wrestling her to his vehicle before raping and strangling her there. It broke both parts of his proximity rule as he murdered in his car and in his hometown. He then did something even more sloppy. He used his victim's credit card at several ATMs in another state to take out money allowing police to track him down.
Coming up, can a hair salon be haunted? You might want to check before your next appointment, assuming you don't want a hair-raising experience. Plus, in 1849 Cincinnati, a gruesome murder in a boarding house shocked the community, revealing a tragic tale of love, abuse, and desperation, eventually exposing a case of domestic abuse that left the courtroom and the city forever changed. These stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Before you head to your next hair appointment, you might want to check if anyone has ever died there, because they might still be hanging around. Hair salons seem to attract mischievous ghosts. Here are some spooky stories about haunted salons that are sure to give you chills. Noxie's Hair in Northfield, UK is known for its creepy paranormal activity. In 2017, it was featured on a YouTube channel by paranormal investigators Dale Macon and Justin Cowell they captured a spooky black mist forming and changing shape inside the salon. This was just one of the many strange events reported there. A customer had seen the mist years earlier, and staff often see a ghostly face in the dark, find vases and mirrors stacked up, have items thrown around, hear strange voices, and notice appliances turning on by themselves. No one knows much about the ghost, but a coin from the 1700s once appeared on the doorstep which some think might be a clue. Michael's Hair Design in Nailsea, UK, has had its own share of spooky events since Michael Pierce took over. The salon, located in a 200-year-old cottage, often had items disappearing or moving around mysteriously, and there was always a weird chill in one of the rooms. The strange happenings went on for so long that a medium was called in to investigate. She confirmed that the salon was haunted by the ghost of a sad little boy. Michael retired and closed the salon in 2022 without ever seeing the ghost himself. No one knows if the little boy still haunts the new owners. Charlotte Y.D. Hale, who owns the Barber's Salon in Frodsham, UK, says her business is haunted by her mom. Her mom passed away four years before Charlotte bought the salon but still seems to be around. Charlotte thinks her mom wants to be a part of the business since she never got the chance while she was alive. She first saw the ghost on her security cameras, capturing an image of a ghostly woman in a mirror and recognized her mom by the way she held her head. Sometimes she even smells burned buttered toast, her mom's favorite. Paranormal Investigations UK also checked it out and believe the salon is haunted by her mom. Charlotte isn't scared and feels lucky her mom is still around, hoping for more visits. Amanda Kist has experienced some seriously spooky stuff while running the Halo Salon in Robbinsdale, Minnesota. A possible poltergeist has been causing chaos, like throwing pictures off the walls and tossing baskets out of the washing machine. Even though electricians found no issues, Amanda's stereo still turns off at the same time every day. She eventually invited a psychic to a Christmas party at the salon who sensed the spirit of an old man named Charlie. Charlie was said to have owned a watch repair business in the area. After talking to local historians, Amanda found out there used to be an old watchmaker's shop nearby. 
You'd think ghosts would be bad for business, but Sally Montag loves that her salon is known as Derby's Most Haunted. Over her 40 years as a hairdresser, both of her salons in this English town have been haunted. People have seen a little dog and marching soldiers in her salon. The soldiers are rumored to be connected to underground tunnels that might have been used by the military. The dog supposedly died after getting sick but came back to visit its owner, who was a salon customer. Sally once heard barking and her customer saw a dog by another person's feet, even though Sally couldn't see it. The customer, with a history of supernatural encounters, said that not everyone can see ghosts. In 1903, a fight in a saloon ended with a man being thrown through a glass window. Decades later, the owner of the Thomas Hardy Salon in Ogden, Utah, and her son heard glass shattering at the same time. The owner was in the basement and her son was upstairs, so they thought the noise came from different floors. They never figured out what caused it. This is just one of the many creepy stories from the Thomas Hardy Salon. Other tales include a ghostly girl appearing in mirrors and the sound of footsteps on the stairs when no one is there. In 1903, a drunk man also fell down those same stairs and broke his neck. Is his ghost seeking revenge or warning people about the dangerous stairs? The staff are so freaked out that they refuse to go into the basement. Missouri salon owner Linda Kloss runs her business out of a 92-year-old house that looks normal from the outside, but inside it's a different story. Kloss and her employees believe the place is haunted. They've seen objects move on their own, appliances turning on by themselves, and Kloss has even seen orbs, bright circles of light that paranormal investigator Hector Lugo thinks transport spirits like in The Wizard of Oz. He says these spirits seem friendly and childlike, though no one knows who they are or what they want. Kloss thinks they might be people who visited the house in the past. A realtor once even captured some of these spirits on camera in the kitchen. Exquisite Styles, located in a 175-year-old Pennsylvania farmhouse, is so creepy it even convinced the owner's skeptical son. The 18-year-old used to laugh at his mom and her staff's stories of weird happenings, but one night while he and his friends were hanging out outside, they suddenly felt a chill and saw lights and a fan turn on by themselves. The owner, Melissa Schaefer, has seen a lot of strange things since running the salon. She thinks the ghost might be John Cooper, a former soldier and maybe a past owner of the farm. Some descendants of a former owner named Cooper claimed to have seen a ghost in a Civil War uniform in the basement. Historians later confirmed that a local named Cooper was in the military, but it's unclear if he owned the farmhouse. Cameras have even captured evidence over the years, showing mysterious, spiny white rods swirling around the room. Massage therapists might claim to get rid of your negative energy, but have you ever wondered where that energy goes? Nancy Carroll, who owns a salon in Arizona, thinks it hangs out in her storage room. She often feels like someone is with her when she is walking down the hallway, even though no one is there. Sometimes she catches a glimpse of someone out of the corner of her eye. One friendly spirit named Lola seems to stick around and actually make people feel happy rather than scared. One of her employees, Jim, even saw a woman in a long white gown walk between him and Nancy during a conversation. This last location is a bit different. It's not about spooky events happening inside a salon, but about the salon itself being eerie. Erie Levinson was wandering around San Francisco with a friend when he saw a small barbershop with red leather chairs on a steep, dark street. The lights were on and the barber was inside, offering $5 haircuts which seemed super cheap. But when Aaron went back the next day for a trim, the shop was gone. He asked an old man for directions and learned that the last barbershop on that street had closed decades ago. When they walked back to where Aaron had seen the shop, there was only a house. Aaron, the son of an architect and a science enthusiast, was always skeptical about ghosts but this experience made him rethink his views on things like disappearing barbershops from the past. On 
On the afternoon of February 2, 1849, Mrs. Lavinia Wolfe, who ran a boarding house in Cincinnati, was working in the kitchen when Mary Ellen Howard, one of her boarders, rushed in from the hall gasping for breath. Her hands were clutched to her throat as blood gushed over them. Mrs. Wolfe, she managed to say weakly, then fell to the floor, silent forever. In a panic, Mrs. Wolfe called for Captain John Howard, whom she believed to be Mary Ellen's husband. Howard rushed downstairs and knelt over the dying woman. Mary, Mary, who did it? Tell me quick, he implored, desperately adding, I'm a ruined man. When he realized she would not recover, he ran upstairs to get his knife, shouting, I know the murderer. Not far from the Wolfe house, attorney John L. Scott saw a woman he knew hurrying down the street. It was Margaret Howard, one of his legal clients. Several years earlier, he had helped Mrs. Howard prepare divorce papers, but in the end, the divorce had not taken place. As he passed her on the street, she appeared extremely disturbed. Scott thought she hadn't recognized him, but then she turned and called out to him. Mr. Scott, do you think I can make anything out of Howard? Bewildered, Scott replied, no, why do you ask me this question? She raised her cloak, revealing a bloody knife with blood covering her arm up to the elbow. Because there is the heart's blood of the wretch who has been living with Howard and keeping me from my children. The murdered woman was named Mary Ellen Smith, but she had been calling herself Mary Ellen Howard, claiming to be the wife of Captain Howard. The murderess was actually Captain Howard's legal wife, Margaret Howard. Margaret Howard, born Margaret Seeley in Dunham, Quebec in 1826, had endured a somewhat unstable upbringing. Her mother died when she was nine, and she was sent to live with an aunt in Ohio. When her father remarried, he took her back, but soon after sent her to a boarding school in Peoria, Illinois. While living in Peoria, Margaret met Captain John Howard and fell in love. He persuaded her to marry him, and in 1841 they eloped to Cincinnati. She was only 15 years old, and he was at least eight years older. In Cincinnati, they lived in poverty in a cheap Front Street hotel. Margaret soon learned that Captain Howard was a professional gambler. Despite his title, he was not really a captain. In 1833, he was a bartender on a steamboat. When the boat became grounded on a sandbar and the captain and officers went for help, leaving Howard in command, he decided to keep the title of captain after giving up the command. Howard had a wicked temper, and after the birth of their son in 1842, he began beating his wife, calling her a damned whore and threatening to kill her with a bowie knife. Eighteen months later, they had a daughter, but Howard's temper had worsened, making Margaret's life intolerable. She took the children and went back to her family. John and Margaret agreed to a final separation. He gave her $500 cash and a worthless $500 note leaving her with the children and what little furniture they had. Margaret moved to Cleveland with her sister and opened a boarding house. Soon after, Captain Howard decided he missed Margaret and wanted her back. He promised to change his ways and begged her to return to Cincinnati. She relented and went back to him, but he did not change. From then on, there was nothing for Margaret but suffering, sickness, destitution, and mental alienation. Finally, she left him again and moved to a boarding house, surviving on what she could earn by sewing and begging, feeding the children with scraps from the landlady's table. While she was living there, Howard stole her children and took them to Kentucky. Margaret managed to get them back through legal means. Back in Cincinnati, she and the children moved from room to room, trying to hide from Howard, but he always found them. One at a time, he kidnapped the children again. Howard continued to harass her, spreading rumors that she was a fallen woman and ruining her reputation. Meanwhile, he moved into a boarding house with Mary Ellen Smith, who posed as his wife and raised the children. Margaret's new lodging challenged her identity, saying, "'Are you Howard's wife or do you only pretend to be? Are you the woman I saw mentioned in the paper the other day, having a fuss about some children?' This reference to her children set Margaret's brain on fire she brooded about them as she worked that day, and after work, she went to Captain Howard's boarding house and asked to see Mrs. Howard. Mary Helen Smith came downstairs. "'Are you Mrs. Howard?' Margaret asked. "'Yes,' was the response. "'How dare you call yourself Mrs. Howard?' Margaret said. "'I am Mrs. Howard.'" 
Mary Ellen reached forward to grab her and Margaret drew a knife, plunging it into Mary Ellen's neck, severing her jugular vein. Margaret rushed from the house and soon after met Mr. Scott on the street. She turned herself in to the marshals. In May 1849, Margaret Howard was tried for the murder of Mary Ellen Smith. She did not deny committing the murder, but pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. Her attorney argued that the years of physical and mental abuse by Captain Howard had driven Margaret insane. She was laboring under monomania, a delusion in reference to two subjects, her husband and her children. On May 5th, the jury returned a verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant not guilty as indicted by reason of her being insane at the time of the commission of the act. The announcement was followed by loud and continued cheers and applause in the courtroom. Margaret's attorney suggested to the court that she was in a state of mind which made it absolutely necessary for her future happiness that she should be sent to the state lunatic asylum. The tragic tale of Margaret Howard is a story of love, abuse, murder, and a demonstration of the extreme lengths to which a person can be driven by years of suffering and mistreatment. In the end, Margaret Howard's story is not just about a single act of violence, but a lifetime of torment that led to a moment of tragic desperation. It's a story that continues to resonate, reminding us of the importance of empathy, justice, and the urgent need to address the root causes of domestic violence and mental health issues. If you've been abused by a loved one and you need help, you can find it free of charge 24 hours a day by calling the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. That's 1-800-799-SAFE. You can also text the word START to 88788 or visit thehotline.org to chat with someone immediately. I have all of this information on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com as well. Up next on Weird Darkness, from reports of undead creatures terrorizing Eastern Europe in the 1700s to scientific explanations behind the myths, we'll take a brief look at vampires and how they straddle the boundary between fiction and fact. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. Bram Stoker's Dracula is widely regarded as one of the most famous works of horror fiction. However, few people know that Stoker's original manuscript included a preface that was cut before the novel was published in 1897. In this outtake, Stoker revealed his belief that he was not writing pure fiction. Quote, I am quite convinced that there is no doubt whatever that the events here described really took place however unbelievable and incomprehensible they might appear at first sight, and I am further convinced that they must always remain to some extent incomprehensible." Unquote. Stoker's creation of Count Dracula was not merely a figment of his imagination, but the culmination of two centuries of beliefs in the undead who walked among and attacked the living in Eastern Europe. 
One of the strongest influences on Stoker and other 19th century authors was the work of 18th century Benedictine monk and distinguished biblical scholar Antoine Augustin Calmet. Calmet's two volume survey, Dissertations Upon the Apparitions of Angels, Demons, and Ghosts, and Concerning the Vampires of Hungary, Bohemia, Moravia, and Silesia, published in 1746, is a valuable repository for vampire lore. In it, Calmet carefully collected and examined numerous reports of vampire attacks emerging from Eastern Europe in the late 17th and early 18th centuries. These accounts triggered intense scholarly debate as philosophers and physicians sought to resolve the disconnect between the report's fantastic details and their reputable sources. Calmet acknowledged in his preface that the academic study of supernatural forces might invite criticism and derision, but he insisted that the testimonies from reliable witnesses were too detailed and consistent to dismiss as pure delusion or outright invention. The validity of the various vampire reports, he argued, merited careful consideration. Calmet documented many accounts of people who claimed to see the dead come back to earth, talk, walk, infest villages, ill-use both men and beasts, suck the blood of their near relations, destroy their health, and finally cause their death. These undead, he wrote, are called by the name of vampires. One of the most famous cases in Calmet's collection came from Austrian army surgeon Johann Flukinger. The doctor described the case of Arnold Pale, a soldier and alleged vampire victim from a Serbian village. To banish vestiges of the vampire, Pale ate dirt from its grave and smeared himself with its blood. He returned to his life as a farmer but soon after died in a hay wagon accident. About a month after his death, villagers claimed that Pale had risen from the dead and killed several people. Animals and livestock were also attacked and drained of blood. Suspecting vampirism, the villagers exhumed Pale's body. They found it intact, even the nails had grown. Fresh blood covered the inside of the coffin. The villagers then drove a stake through his heart, whereby he gave an audible groan and bled copiously. The bodies of other villagers, thought to have been transformed into vampires, were disinterred and likewise maimed in an attempt to kill them for good. The incorruptibility of a corpse was thought to be evidence that a dead person was a vampire. Comet noted that some bodies, after several months or even years in the grave, were found with the blood in a liquid state, the flesh entire, the limbs flexible and pliable. While the observation was accurate, science rather than the supernatural can explain such postmodern phenomena. The belief in vampirism largely grew out of a lack of knowledge about the natural processes of decomposition after death, which can, under certain conditions, be delayed for a long period. A body can remain well-preserved through two natural processes. One of them, saponification, occurs when the body is buried in a cold, damp environment, as is common in Eastern Europe. During the saponification process, the body's fatty acids turn into a waxy, soap-like compound that covers the corpse and prevents putrefaction. A saponified body also retains a certain flexibility, as described in Calmet's work. Accounts in Calmet's dissertations also noted that vampires' hair and fingernails continued to lengthen even after death. Certain post-mortem changes may have given the illusion of continued growth. After death, the skin dehydrates, causing it to retract from the hair follicles. This may make the hair, especially stubble on the chin, look longer. The same is true of nails, as the skin around them retracts and makes more of the nail bed visible. Bloodstains on an unearthed corpse were also considered a sign that someone had become a vampire. As Calmet explained, vampires suck the blood of living men or animals in such abundance that sometimes it flows from them at the nose and sometimes the corpse swims in its own blood oozed out in its coffin. Again, medical science can provide an explanation. The length of time that blood remains liquid depends on environmental conditions. In cold temperatures, the blood can stay fluid for at least three to four days. If bodies were unearthed during that period on suspicion of vampirism, blood could still be found in their veins. Stories of corpses being stained with blood or swimming in blood, the latter likely an exaggeration, may have been derived from post-mortem hemorrhages. A blow to the body during transfer to its resting place 
can result in a trauma sufficient to make blood appear to flow from the nose or mouth. As illustrated by the story of Arnold Pale, popular belief held that to kill a vampire, the corpse had to be disinterred and pierced with a stake. Allegedly, when the stake penetrated the body, the vampire would let out a cry, further proof that the vampire had been alive. But a natural explanation pertains to this, too. Air enclosed in the thoracic cavity forced out when the body was struck was likely to produce sound as it passed through the throat. Already believing they were face to face with an undead vampire, this noise could have sounded like a cry of pain to witnesses. In a situation of great tension, the imagination could amplify the slightest of noises to a blood-chilling moan. In 1762, philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau incredulously attacked Calmet's work. He noted, quote, if there is in this world a well-attested account, it is that of vampires. Nothing is lacking. Official reports, affidavits of surgeons, of priests, of magistrates, and with all that, who is there who believes in vampires?" Unquote. Rousseau may have doubted, but the supernatural belief that the dead could rise to terrorize went beyond reason in 17th and 18th century Eastern Europe. Calmet's collection of vampire stories fed the imagination and inspired several 19th century authors, John William Polidori, Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu, and Bram Stoker, who all helped pioneer the vampire story as a popular literary genre. The tale of vampires from Calmet's careful documentation to Stoker's Dracula showcases a fascinating evolution of belief in the supernatural. What began as accounts of undead creatures in Eastern Europe transformed into a cornerstone of horror literature captivating generations of readers. The combination of scientific misunderstanding and vivid storytelling has ensured that the legend of vampires will continue to haunt our collective imagination for years to come. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 22 verse 2 – The rich and poor have this in common. The Lord made them both. And a final thought, you can have everything in life you want if you will just help other people get what they want. Zig Ziglar I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.